to the September NASA Night Sky Network member webinar. We're hosting tonight's webinar from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California. We're very excited to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Joseph Lazio from NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Welcome to everyone joining us on YouTube. We're very happy to have you with us. These webinars are monthly events for members of the Night Sky Network. For more information about the NASA Night Sky Network and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, check the links in the chat. Before we introduce Joseph, here's Dave Prosper with just a few announcements. As I've unmuted myself. So uh, just so you know, uh, it's that time of year. We've got our first UFO report that in our inboxes that turned out to be the star of Fomalhaut, which reminds me that uh, we should have the new Night Sky Notes out tomorrow. And now you have a little hint about what it's about. Uh, we have been crushed with work. And even though it's the technical deadline, I like to get it out a little earlier. Um, so uh, in case you didn't know, uh, we make a monthly article called NASA's Night Sky Notes. It kind of like took the baton from NASA Space Place for their monthly article for uh, Astronomy Club newsletters. And you can use it for yours for free. And, uh, and of course, uh, you can also edit out my excessive exclamation points if you so wish. <laughs> I try to do that myself, but I'm a little too enthusiastic at times. Anyway, we link to these notes in our, in our own newsletter every month, which you also get, if, probably if you're on here already. And sample articles are on our front page, and you can find the latest edition and sign up for alerts when the new newsletter comes out and access our past archives at bit.ly slash night sky notes. And I'll put that link in the chat right there. And also, um, just so you know, we have another little announcement. Um, but they're not ready to order yet, but we have, they've just arrived, the Night Sky Network outreach pins for this year. Um, and uh, here's a little peek. I gotta turn off my autofocus to hopefully get a better view. Whoop. There we go. You can see that beautiful JWS team mirror there. Um, so yeah, uh, we believe they should be ready. To, we'll be ready to start accepting orders around sometime in October, and we'll send it an announcement in the newsletter and in the um, special extra announcement as well, just to make sure you all know that it's time to order. And of course, just a reminder, um, uh, of course, uh, to order the pins, you need to uh, report on your events and make sure that they're already scheduled so you can report on them. And we need at least five uh, for 2022 to, for your club to qualify. And every club gets three free pins that does do the reporting, um, extras will be a little extra. We'll have the details of all that in October. Um, can't wait to tell you all about it. Um, and yes, you must be a Night Sky Number member club to order the pins. And Vivian has another announcement for Eclipse Ambassadors. Vivian. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Uh, those pins are really beautiful. I'm excited about them. Um, I just want to let you all know that we are recruiting for the uh, eclipse ambassadors off the paths for the next two upcoming eclipses in 2023 and 2024. It's a really fun program. You partner amateur astronomers with undergraduates and you can mentor them a little bit and um, get them to know about the astronomy community in your community. And um, then you'll be trained together to offer really wonderful outreach as you all already do, but we'll um, send you a big package of lots of materials. You can do all of the outreach before the eclipses. You do not have to be anywhere in particular for the eclipses themselves, of course, because we know many of you hopefully will be traveling to the path at least for 2024. So um, uh, we encourage you to sign up. I've got a link right here I'll put in the chat. And um, uh, it's a pretty quick application, just about 15 minutes. And um, and we will uh, we're selecting people right now for the... Um, pilot workshop that's happening in October. So if you'd like to get a head start and lots of great materials, a very cool NASA partner badge um, uh, akin to the Solar System Ambassador badge, uh, I think that uh, you'll have a good time at it too. So I'm putting the link with lots more information in the chat. Thanks for letting me share it. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Vivian. 
For those of you on Zoom, you can find the chat window and the Q&A window in a button at the bottom edge of the Zoom window on your desktop. Please feel free to greet each other in the chat window or to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. And all, as always, remember to select everyone in the chat window. Um, otherwise, the only people that see your greeting are those of us on your screen. Uh, put all of your questions that you have uh, for our speaker in the Q&A window. That helps us to not lose track of them. If you do have a technical issue, you can drop that into the chat, or you can send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. And let me hit the record button here. If I can find it, there it is. So welcome to the September webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Dr. Joseph Lazio to our webinar. Joseph is the Interplanetary Network Director at Scientist at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology. He received his PhD from Cornell University, was a National Research Council Research Associate at the US Naval Research Laboratory, and was a radio astronomer on the staff of the Naval Research uh, lab before joining JPL. He's a project scientist for the Sun Radio Interferometer Space Experiment mission, and he has served, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed at all these missions. I, I swear that everyone decides what the acronym is going to be before they name it, and then they give it up these uh, long <laughs> names. Uh, the Sunrise mission, and he has served as project scientist for the Square Kilometer Array, or SCA, or maybe it's SCA, um, the Deputy Director of the Lunar University Network for Astrophysics Research, Lunar, part of the NASA Lunar Science Institute, and the Project Scientist for the U.S. Virtual Astronomical Observatory. He also observes routinely <coughs> with the world's premier ground-based radio telescopes, including the Expanded Very Large Array, the Very Long Baseline Array, and the Green Bank Telescope. So please welcome Dr. Joseph Lazio. Greetings, uh, sound check. You can hear me? We can. Excellent. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you for that introduction. Um, gives me great pleasure to be here. Thanks for the in invitation. Um, and I will, this worked before, so it will work again. You should see my slides. So I'm going to. And they're beautiful. Excellent. Um, I'm going to describe to you the deep space network, a uh, picture of or a portion of which you see here. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to talk about the deep space network or the DSN, but um, I have the ple pleasure and privilege of talking about it. A lot of the credit, most of the credit goes to the engineers and the technicians that are at the various complexes, which you'll see momentarily are literally all around the world. They keep these antennas working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and almost 60 years running. So it's a, a real credit to them in the field uh, that I can actually talk about this to you. Okay. However, let me actually start by there's uh, this really neat mission called Lucy, which is going to um, the so-called uh, Trojan asteroids. Uh, the This is a, a mission actually launched uh, earlier this year. It's going to the Trojan asteroids, which are uh, a set of asteroids that are captured in orbits such that they always, rem they're at the same orbit as Jupiter. They're either ahead of Jupiter or behind Jupiter in the, in the orbit. And you, if you can see in sort of the upper right hand of this image, uh, you can see a picture or render, rendering of, of Jupiter to indicate that they are this. The, the motivation for this mission is that we think that these asteroids probably are some of the, the primordial remnants of what actually formed uh, Jupiter and the other planets or the planets in the solar system. And so these are in some sense uh, true primordial remnants of the solar system. The, the mission actually owes its name. It's named in the same sense as uh, the Australopithecus uh, fossil that was found in 1974. Uh, they both owe their name in some sense. Uh, well, the Lucy mission owes its name to the sense that these primordial asteroids are thought to be remnants of early formation, just as the, the skeleton, the Australopithecus skeleton is of, of our early uh, ancestors. But then, of course, they both owe their name to a Beatles song. Um, we earlier also saw 
uh, a reference to the James Webb Space Telescope. So it is flying now. I hope you've all been ogling over the images, much as those of us here at JPL have been uh, really astounding. Of course, these are just the first look images in many cases. Uh, once we start getting many deeper images and many more objects, uh, it really is gonna help replicate. The Deep Space Network is three complexes of antennas spread about equidistant around the world. And if you imagine, you can understand immediately, or I hope um, understand intuitively, why there are three complexes. If you imagine that you're at some, you know, pick your favorite planet or pick your, pick your favorite place in the, in the solar system, what you can see is as the world turns, you can always see one or more of these complexes. Uh, so that means essentially all the time, we have one or more antennas that can send a command to a spacecraft or receive data from it. Uh, the bottom uh, pictures show the, the complexes or pictures of the complexes. You can see, again, that at each complex, there are multiple antennas. Now, in fact, uh, these pictures are, the pictures at the bottom are slightly out of date. Uh, earlier this, this year, we welcomed one new of the one one of the new antennas into the the network. So this is one of the uh, newest. This is the newest antenna uh, that was welcomed into the network. It was constructed at the Madrid complex in in Spain. Uh, the importance of this can be seen by the fact that the King of Spain actually showed up for the the inauguration ceremony, and uh, it again. Going back to my earlier statement, it's a real testament to the, the engineers and technicians in the field because, of course, this, an, uh, this antenna was constructed largely during the pandemic. It was, it was commissioned during the pandemic, so it, it made everything much more complex in terms of dealing with health and safety, but nonetheless, the teams brought it uh, online, and, and in fact, it's being used. Um, this is actually, we are in the process of constructing another antenna. This is now at the Goldstone Complex, which is actually about um, sort of uh, three, three hours over my shoulder or something. Um, I, I did take a look. You can see the picture here is dated from July. I did take a look uh, this afternoon at, at the picture. There's a webcam that, that we can you know, watch the, the progress, the construction progress. You could barely tell that there was any difference. There's a little bit, a little bit of more of the foundation or upper level. So there's some gold. Actually, if you can see my cursor, there's a little bit of gold um, that's uh, gold support structure that's been added here or gold gold colored support structure. Uh, but essentially there is a, another antenna that is being constructed. It'll come online in a couple more years. So we're constantly adding uh, antenna, well constant, we are continuing to add antennas to the network uh, in an effort to expand the capability and, and essentially enable uh, more missions across NASA. Okay, and in fact, uh, you can watch, so this um, is, in fact, you can sort of tell that this is an outdated view of, uh, this is an outdated screenshot. So if I stop sharing and I now reshare, if you go to, if you go, um, say, to, whoops, share, uh, what you should now be able to see, uh, oh, the wait, sorry, I've got to stop the screen and go to my web browser. What I hope you can actually see now is this is a real-time view of NASA's deep space network. This is DSN now. So in fact, if you just go you know, after this clock, uh, go to eyes.nasa.gov, uh, you should be able to find the, the real-time view of NASA's deep space network. So uh, again, I'm hoping that you are actually seeing my, my screen and you can actually see what antennas are, are operating currently, um, which ones are bringing down data from which spacecraft and, and on the right hand side of the panel, you can actually click in, you can click on either the antenna or the mission to get more details. Uh, an important aspect what this shows is that at each complex, there is there are multiple 34 meter diameter antennas. So those are the smaller ones. And then there is one 70 meter antenna and you can see the importance of the 70 meter antennas right now as, as, as I'm talking, as this webinar is going on, uh, the 70 meter antenna out at Goldstone is sending commands to a, or receiving data from the Voyager 1 spacecraft. So if I now go back to the actual presentation. So again, now you should be uh, back in seeing uh, I got to get this out of my way. Uh, wait. 
Okay, that's, hang on a sec. Technology works wonderfully when I get it to work, right? And, okay, uh, just a quick confirmation. I'm back where I'm supposed to be. You're actually seeing the um, the PowerPoint screenshot of, of a previous DSN now. That's what it looks like. Excellent, okay. Okay, so now the first question is, I just said 34 meters and 70 meters. Uh, let's do a quick, um, you know, sort of, uh, you don't have to answer, you don't have to shout out the answer, but what does 70 meters actually mean? So if you were just to pick, you know, A, B, C, note to yourself, it'll be uh, an, you know, uh, on your honor type of thing. What does 70 meters actually mean? Well, 70 meters, I, uh, to, to illustrate what 70 meters means, uh, I put it in the context of a local Pasadena icon, the Rose Bowl. So what you can see here is that a, a 70 meter antenna is large enough to essentially play a football game, whatever flavor of football you favor, uh, in, in the dish itself. And the reason that, that these antennas are so large, you know, even 34 meters, uh, we think of as the small ones in the network, but they're still impressive sites. Uh, the, the spacecraft are distant, right? Voyager 1 is out, outside the solar system. And so the, the spacecraft, the signals that we receive from the spacecraft are incredibly faint. In fact, uh, one, is sort of those, one of those factoids is if you were to, to add up, you know, how long would it take um, uh, the Voyager 1 spacecraft, all of the power that we've ever received, you really couldn't run the, the refrigerator, you know, the little light in your refrigerator, you couldn't run it for more than a second, because the spacecraft signals are so faint, the amount of power that, that we are receiving on Earth is really small, and it takes these really big antennas uh, to, to collect the, the, enough power to actually get the data or get the images back. In fact, it would be a completely different, you know, I'm going to talk a very high level. It's a it's a, an entire engineering lecture or series of lectures to describe the, the antennas. There's a lot of uh, still cutting edge electronics and, and related aspects that go into one of these antennas. Okay, so now I've said, you know, deep space network is, is integral to enabling NASA space missions, uh, space exploration of the solar system and beyond. Again, on your honor, uh, how many missions do you think uh, NASA, the Deep Space Network is enabling to say this week. So I'm, you know, we should cue up the Jeopardy music here. But the answer is, this is the current NASA Deep Space Network mission suite. So these are all of the missions. If you were to look over the course of a week, you would, on average, uh, you'd see all of these missions showing up. Um, you know, not all of them have the same amount of time, and there are some interesting aspects like Voyager 2, you only see it because of where it's located in the sky. Uh, those of us in the Northern Hemisphere can't actually see the location of Voyager 2, so it's only the Canberra complex. Uh, but essentially, in a typical week, the Deep Space Network is enabling about three dozen missions. The other thing is, and I've sort of already given this part of the talk away, if you look in the upper left, of course, not all of these missions are inside the solar system. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are outside the solar system. New Horizons is currently what we say in the in the solar system, but it's headed out as well. It's, it's on an escape trajectory. It's going. It'll never come back. And uh, so, you know, give it, a, I don't remember exactly how many years, but give it enough time, New Horizons will also be outside the solar system. Um, the other thing that the other reason I really like this this figure of again the kind of space exploration that that deep space network enables, well, so Voyager one, Voyager two, and and New Horizons they're on their way out of the solar system. They're outside the solar system, so they're they're kind of exploring nearby interstellar space. You can see the Mars Armada in the upper right hand corner. You can see various planets, but if you also look, for instance, sort of toward the bottom left. Um, TESS, uh, Chandra, JWST, XMM Newton. These are space telescopes. These are astrophysics. They're they're in some actually, um, with the exception of JWST and Gaia, they're all in more or less Earth orbit, but they're looking out into the universe. So they're one of the ways that we study the universe, and it's really a case of the DSN enabling everything from studying like LRO, which is at the moon, studying our local satellite to the di most distant reaches of the universe. 
It's also a case that although it's NASA's deep space network, in some sense, it's enabling space exploration for all of humanity. So if you look at the Mars Armada in the upper right, um, there's, for instance, MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and I'm sure you're familiar with Curiosity and Perseverance rovers. Uh, those are NASA missions. But Mars TGO, Mars Trace Gas Observer, that's a European mission. If you look in the lower left, the Gaia mission, this is essentially, this is one of these missions that's rewriting the astronomy textbooks. It's a European mission. It's a European Space Agency mission. If you bounce back to the upper right, you see this, this mission that affectionately seems to be called MOM, the Mars uh, Observer, uh, Mars Orbiter mission. That's an Indian Space Research uh, Organization mission uh, from, from the nation of India. You can also see um, the in the sort of, in the, again, part of the Mars Armada, the Emirates Mars mission. So that's the Emirates, the United Arab Emirates. They've sent a, a mission to Mars uh, that is orbiting Mars now and, and is using the deep space network. And uh, in the lower right, I don't have the image or I don't have the icon in there yet, but KPLO is the Korean Pathfinder Lunar Observer uh, uh, Orbiter uh, from South Korea. Uh, it's their most recent mission, and in fact, it has launched, and I can't remember if it's actually in lunar orbit now uh, or not, but but essentially, yes, it's NASA's deep space network, uh, but in a very real sense, it's enabling exploration. Oh, and I forgot to mention, sorry, I forgot to mention, uh, I now, uh, I'm now remembering Akutasaki, which is in the middle there. Um, that's a mission around uh, Venus that is oh, from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency or the Japanese uh, Space Agency, as is on the on the far left, the Hayabusa 2 mission. So again, yes, it's NASA's deep space, but in some sense, it's for all of humanity. We're really enabling space exploration and, and discovery for all of humanity. Okay, so that's Deep Space Network. That's the standard um, description of it, what it does. It's integral for, again, almost every image that you've ever seen from from a, another planet in our solar system and you know some number of the astrophysical discoveries that you've uh, uh you've heard about have come through one or more of antennas of the deep space network now um i said earlier that uh one of the, you know, the, the, I've talked about delivering data. So it actually recovers the data from these various spacecraft or it receives the data. It also sends commands up. So I'd like to now switch to one of the science uses uh, for the deep space network that is a standalone use. And it's represented by the icon of the lower right, the, this thing called the GSSR. So you can imagine if I can send a command, so I can send signals on a radio wave to a, a, spacecraft somewhere in the solar system, I could also target other things in the solar system. And in the case of a spacecraft, it receives the, the commands and it does something and then transmits it back. But if it's a natural object, say the moon or Venus or Mercury or Mars or a, an asteroid, the, the target will naturally, re, naturally reflect the signal. And that's what we call radar. So in fact, the virtual, uh, antenna behind me or my virtual background is the 70 meter, I already referred to it, it's a 70 meter out at Goldstone. But one of its other uses is it's used in planetary radar. So we call it, the, when it's used for that, we call it the Goldstone Solar System Radar. And it's been used um, actually to study uh, Mercury, Venus, the Moon, uh, essentially, all of the objects out to Saturn, well, all of the major, let's see, all of the objects in the inner solar system with, with solid surfaces, and then some of the major moons of both Jupiter and Saturn. And again, the idea is very similar. You send, instead of sending uh, specific commands to a spacecraft, you target a natural body, uh, and you look for the, the reflection, and then you study how the body reflects it to learn some science. Now, why would you want to do this? So the Goldstone Solar System Radar, there are actually three, three reasons that you'd want to do this. One is just a science uh, aspect. Um, it's complex and costly to send a mission to, say, an asteroid or to another body in the solar system. If we can study it from the ground, uh, it may be less expensive, and we can get uh, some good information nonetheless. So in fact, the little animation that you see uh, repeating to the left on the screen here, this is a Goldstone solar system radar or Goldstone radar image of a near earth asteroid. And what you can tell is it's actually a sequence of movies. So you can actually see this object rotating. 
you can get some sense of actually how big it is. And in fact, if you look at it, you watch, you see that the surface doesn't reflect uniformly. There are parts that are brighter and some parts that are dimmer. Like as the movie comes around, uh, if you can see my cursor, like there's this little bright spot or bright wedge that shows up. So that's probably some kind of real structure, a cliff or something on this asteroid. We're actually getting, um, you know, some indication of what the structure of this, the surface features are on this asteroid uh, from the ground without actually having to send a spacecraft there. Uh, the other reason that, that radar is important, so let me back up a couple of slides. I've talked about these various missions. Um, all of these missions, uh, these three missions here, Hayabusa 2, OSIRIS-REx, and DART, uh, are, are missions to asteroids and Psyche, which is in the lower right, it hasn't, it was supposed to launch this year, but it's been delayed. Uh, it is also a mission to an asteroid. All of the targets for those missions were identified on the basis of radar observations. In fact, it was radar observations of the asteroid 16 Psyche to which the Psyche mission is going to travel that helped identify it as a, as a promising target for study. And one part, one reason for using radar to study these objects is just to understand, you know, is it a good target? But the other reason is the orbit determination. So by, by lighting up an asteroid with radar, we get a very precise orbit determination, and it's a precise enough determination that we can actually send a spacecraft to that target. In fact, the very first use of uh, the precursor to what is today's Goldstone Solar System radar was to figure out how far away Venus is because in the very early days of space exploration, think late 50s, early 60s, we didn't actually know how many meters it was to Venus at, with enough precision that we could send a spacecraft to it. And once we did that, then we could send spacecraft all over the solar system. Uh, the final reason for wanting to do radar, and this has kind of been one of the major reasons that the Goldstone radar has been operating over the past decade or so, is planetary defense. In the upper right, uh, you can actually see what is really the contrail from an asteroid that hit the Earth in 2013. So this was a relatively small asteroid. It was about 20 meters in diameter. And uh, as you can sort of see from the contrail, it came in at a glancing, uh, a glancing blow. And uh, I don't have a picture of it here, but, but a fragment of the asteroid was later recovered from a, a lake in Russia. Um, so the Earth, is, the Earth is hit, in fact, all the time by, by these relatively small ones, uh, small objects. Uh, we would like to, of course, understand um, their orbits well enough that we can under, you know, predict what is the risk that they will hit us in the future. Uh, this particular object is interesting. It's a good, a good lesson. Uh, it's sort of like if you're near an ocean and you start to see the ocean go out, you know, recede, that may be an indication of tsunami and you should not follow the ocean, you should run for high ground. So if you see a contrail like this or a bright light and a contrail like this in the sky, uh, don't rush for the windows to, to gaze because lots of people in, in Russia did that. And this asteroid, uh, the subsequent shock wave blew out, uh, some blew out windows across the, uh, the trajectory, sent many, maybe hundreds of people to the hospital with various cuts from the, the flying glass. And ultimately it would cause something like $1.6 billion in, uh, worth of damage. So the radar system, one of the key targets is these asteroids in an effort to understand or uh, determine their orbits precisely enough to then make predictions in the future. And in fact, just by illuminating one of these asteroids, we can often extend how far into the future we can predict its orbit to centuries. Uh, but again, let me focus in on the science. Here's an example of some of the science and, and why the power of doing ground-based radar with, with the Goldstone Solar System radar. Uh, this was a, an object you can see here, 2017 um, DQ, I think six uh, from, from a few years ago now. The press release that came out compared this asteroid to a Dungeon and Dragon die. You can see that it, it has very sharp, almost angular features or facets. And I'm not a geophysicist or, or a geologist, but how do you get a, an asteroid with these sharp features and how do they stay well-defined potentially over cosmic time? Uh, my understanding is nobody actually understands why this asteroid looks the way it does. And yet here's the power of the radar 
uh, by taking the sequence of images, and you can actually, again, see it rotate in this, or see the effects of its rotation. Um, you can actually just make, you know, we don't understand how this object formed or why it survived like this. Ask a very basic science question about these objects. Um, another, you know, again, on your honor, what do you think? Are asteroids likely to have moons? Cue up Jeopardy music, and you know, you've got a 50% chance. Well, the answer is, in fact, uh, that asteroids do have moons. So let's see. Um, so this particular uh, nicely called 1998 QE2, you can see the little speck there as the, <coughs> excuse me, as the, um, as the movie continues. So that little bright spot that is moving toward the bottom of the uh, image is a, a moon of this asteroid. Um, and in fact, something like one in five, actually maybe it's one in six or seven, but you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20% of all asteroids have uh, moons. And most of them are detected from the radar properties of when they light them up, uh, it's like, oh, look, there's a second reflection, if you will, that's the moon. And the power, I mean, part of it's just nobody kind of expected asteroids to have moons, didn't think, well, they, or do they have a strong enough gravity field to, to actually retain a moon? The other reason is uh, very basic um, celestial mechanics. If you have a, a moon, then you actually have a very powerful way of determining what the mass of the asteroid is. And in fact, one of the very basic questions of an asteroid is, are these like in some sense solid chunks of rock or are they really just lots of little boulders that barely hold themselves together by their own gravity? And having the mass, having the mass determined from the orbit of a, a moon, it's one of the really the few ways that we can address that question. Okay, the, um, now the big news, so you're gonna hear a lot more about this uh, asteroid Apophis. Uh, this sequence of images, this was taken earlier this year, or this sequence of radar images, and you might say, well, geez, you know, this kind of doesn't look like much. Uh, it doesn't look that impressive. Apophis is a 380 meter diameter and uh, asteroid, and you're going to hear a lot about it because on Friday, the 13th, in the year 2029, this asteroid is going to come really, really close to the Earth. So if you're in the right spot, I think the right spot is kind of in the middle of Atlantic, so maybe book your cruises now, but if you're in the right spot, um, this object will be a naked eye, it'll be a naked eye object. It certainly you'll be able to see it with binoculars and it will move across the sky. Uh, if you know what the geosynchronous belt of, of satellites are that, that orbit the Earth and provide a lot of our tele, telecommunications infrastructure, um, it's going to come within the geosynchronous belt. So it's gonna come within something like 30,000 kilometers of the earth. And you can see here, this sequence shows how it approaches, how its orbit is predicted to change um, as, it, as it goes by the earth. Uh, all these little green, let me see if I can run this movie again, or this little animation again. Um, so these are the opportunities. Goldstone is of course our workhorse radar. And then we have a, a second, possible facility down in Canberra. So it's actually, it's a slightly less powerful, but still very useful. You can see these are all the opportunities to get looks at, at the asteroid. And part of the, you know, among the questions are going to be things like just how much does the earth uh, change the, the orbit of the asteroid? Do we see because of the tides, this the asteroid is gonna come close enough. Um, we're going to get much better, much better images than this. Does the, does the surface feature change um, as a result of say the, the tides or essentially the, you know, the side of the asteroid that's closer to the earth is gonna be pulled a little bit more strongly than the one that's on the far side or the farther side of the asteroid. So does it, does, are there essentially landslides on the, on the asteroid? Uh, so this is gonna be a really big deal. Uh, you're gonna hear a lot about it. In fact, you know, maybe you've already heard about it if you read the right British tabloids and the reason that I can state with such confidence that it will not hit the Earth is that these sequence of radar images have now determined the position of the asteroid to within 10 meters. So the room in which I'm sitting is something probably five meters in size or something like that. So this 300 meter, 380 meter asteroid, we know its orbit to, you know, sort of a little bit bigger than the size of the room in which I'm sitting now, or, you know, maybe if you're at home, uh, a typical room might be 
say five to 10 meters, you know, depending upon the size of the room in which you're sitting, you might be sitting in a room that's 10 meters. You can just sort of look around and say, we know the orbit of, of this asteroid because of these radar observations to something like 10 meters. And so we can predict with, with, vert, with, with complete certainty, it will not hit the earth in 2029. Uh, one of the other questions was, is it going to hit the Earth in 2036 because it does another pass by? And the answer is no. So we can predict it you know, decades and uh, maybe even a century into, into the future if it will not hit the Earth. Nonetheless, you're going to hear a lot about it. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about it, and I'm sure that you will hear some from the British tabloids as well. Okay, so um, I, I intentionally did not have a long presentation. I wanted to leave some time for other questions or conversation, uh, but I've, you know, I've do, please do not leave the Earth without the Deep Space Network. And uh, I've also tried to give you a hint of the Deep Space Network is not only integral to the space exploration, but it's a science instrument in its own right uh, by providing this unique information on, on solid bodies, in the, particularly in the inner solar system, with a lot of emphasis on, on asteroids. And I now see something like um, a dozen questions queued up in the Q&A, so I'm happy to turn to, to Q&A. Yep, we do have quite a few questions. And so thank you very much. This is a really great. So let's, uh, you know, start off uh, at the top, we had a couple of questions having to do with uh, the Trojan asteroids. And we, um, they were curious whether or not Earth has any Trojan asteroids, and if we have, you know, given any thought to a mission to those. Um. The Earth has, and I'm trying to remember if it's one, one permanent or one temporary Trojan asteroid. Um, there is, there's been at least one object that um, has been identified in, as an Earth Trojan. Um, I think it's kind of not my field. And so I'm sort of, I'm hesitating to say much more other than uh, I, I honestly don't remember if it's a big mystery of why the Earth doesn't have more Trojans or not. Um, so I'd, I'd better leave it at, there's been one, I'm sure there's been one that's been identified as an Earth Trojan. Earth has nowhere near the number as Jupiter. I could speculate that it has to do with um, just the various gravitational forces on Earth Trojans versus Jupiter Trojans, but I, I don't remember enough to say much more than that. I just wanted to note here too, is that over the last couple of years, we've had uh, quite a few of these webinars have been with uh, about asteroids. And uh, we had uh, one on DART not particularly long ago. And then uh, a year ago um, in August, we had uh, Kathy Alkin, I think her name was, uh, did uh, one on the Lucy mission. And so you could go back into the uh, Night Sky Network website and find some of those old webinars and learn more about these uh, actually fascinating objects out there. And, so. and since you made reference to DART, I didn't really highlight it but yeah dart uh you know the subtext what the the second title uh the alternate title for dart is earth strikes back and of course um one of the one of the part you know, one of the big targets for the goldstone solar system radar is going to be looking at at the did the asteroid didymos after the impact to figure out what happened to its orbit and so that's kind of a, a, another thing too is that uh, when you're talking about asteroids having moons is that they're not actually hitting they're actually going to smack it into the moon. Moon, uh, right. Asteroid. And so and that's actually a good question is, are you going to be monitoring that with the uh, with the Deep Space Network uh, radar wise or just waiting for the data that comes back? Uh, uh, both. Earth? Both. So the DART, as you, uh, if I scroll back, you'll see the DART was one of the missions that, that is enabled by the DSN. So it's actually retrieving data, uh, but then it's also a target for the Goldstone radar. Okay, fantastic. So we had a question here and that this is interesting. And, and so it has to do with uh, the different comm signals and, and there's kind of three questions here, but let me see if I can combine them. Um, and so the Deep Space Network, are you basically using a, a single frequency? Um, are there any interference problems? And what do you do about, uh, you know, you know you're probably able to be, uh, you know, listening to several different satellites or missions at the same time. And so, what do you do about the interference, and uh, and if it's on the same frequency or uh, multiple frequencies? That's a, a great question. Um, so the the spacecraft um, 
the various missions have, they do have well-defined frequencies. Um, and, and that's done intentionally to try to avoid them essentially interfering with each other. Uh, there's a bigger picture question, which is the range of frequencies that, that deep space spacecraft use is a particular band, which is agreed to by uh, an international body called the International Telecommunications Union uh, that sits under the United Nations. And that's done internationally to coordinate so that, that because these signals are so faint, we have to be very careful about somebody else at a different frequency um, unintentionally broadcasting, you know, some of the power that they're transmitting at a different frequency could still spill into the bands that, that are used. So there's, a, there's an issue of both interference and we try very hard and we coordinate internationally to avoid that. Um, the spacecraft themselves, uh, have well-defined uh, frequencies. Almost think of it as if you go to an FM or an AM radio dial. You know, you step between various stations. You can almost, you can think of an analogous feature for uh, the the spacecraft. Now, the interesting thing I didn't really highlight it, but it is uh, a, if I flip back to this. Um, actually, this one shows it. So if you're still seeing the, the display, this is again an out of date, but it shows at the time I took this screenshot, uh, one of the antennas in uh, Madrid was actually communicating with, that's Mars Odyssey, MAVEN and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, simultaneously. So at Mars, and you know, sort of it was tongue in cheek, right? The Mars Armada, but, but there are enough spacecraft at Mars that we've actually worked out of the deep space network engineers have worked out a way that we can monitor multiple spacecraft. At the moment, it's up to four. Uh, monitor or receive the signals from four of them, simul up to four of them simultaneously. And in fact, actually, you can see here, this was, <clears throat> uh, this would have been in a handoff period. So probably Madrid was getting ready to hand off to Goldstone. Um, these spacecraft were being tracked by, by Madrid, but you can see Goldstone was getting set up to do the same, including also the Mars Science Laboratory or Curiosity. So I hope that's answered the question of, yeah, well-defined frequencies, we try to ensure that nobody else interferes with us. They're well-defined so as to not to interfere with each other. And then at Mars, because there are so many spacecraft, we can actually communicate with multiple ones. So that actually kind of brings up an interesting question is, is uh, are the signals encrypted at all? Is there uh, the possibility that somebody could uh, decide to construct their own um, antenna and, uh, and uh, grab the signals, uh, you know, before you guys do or at the same time? They are, they are certainly coded. Uh, so there's a whole literature and a whole field of how to encode the signals. Um, certainly on the downlink. And this is more for error checking purposes. Um, so, you know, the signals are very faint. Um, you want to make make sure that if, you, you want to make sure that the data getting come, that are coming down, you've actually received it accurately. And so what is typically done, there are various ways to do this, of encoding in a way that you have not only the data, but then some amount of error checking as well. And, that that there are both ways to do that efficiently, but it's also a, just an error checking of, yeah, I really get did get down uh, the signals that I thought I would get down um, just for an error checking. And, and that's just from the basic, I, I'll, I'll gloss over some of the underlying physics, but there is some underlying physics that that goes into, you know, there's there's some amount of always noise in the system, you can't get rid of it. And so you there's always the possibility that some bit will get flipped uh, and something will will look bad so you always have some error checking that's just that's just from the physics uh, more recently there is an effort to encrypt the signals so that you can actually ensure uh, in some sense security of the command that if we send a command to the spacecraft we know we're the ones sending it not somebody else Okay, that seems like a wise thing. How about the, the data coming back? I mean, I know that there's a, that scientists are uh, interested in openness, but, uh, you know, countries aren't necessarily interested in openness. And, and so is there 
let's say if I decided that I wanted to construct uh, uh, an antenna in my backyard, you know, could I, you know, tap into the signals myself? In in principle, yes, but without knowing how they're uh, encoded, I think, okay. or you'd, you'd spend a fair amount of time uh, trying to figure out how they, you know, exactly the coding and all of that kind of thing. Okay. So we also have a question, and, and uh, does China or Russia use the Deep Space Network? I know that they have fairly robust space programs of their own, or do they have their own networks that they use? They, they have their own networks um, with a certain number of similarities, but, but they have their own networks. Okay. Uh, as, as I should add, Europe uh, has its own network, uh, but we have, a, we have a sharing agreement between NASA and ESA uh, in which, uh, or the European Space Agency, you know, they can use our antennas, we can use theirs, and and we keep track of uh, sort of making sure that everybody's getting fair use. Japan has a much more limited, but it's the same arrangement. You know, they can use our antennas, we can use its their its antennas, and there's there's not an official agreement, but India has an, at least one antenna, and you know there can be some cross sharing there. Mm -hmm. So we had a couple of people ask, ask the question is, and so we're using um, the radar. Is there any thoughts about using optical or laser um, type things to communicate with the spacecraft? Yes. Uh, in fact, one of the um, one of the aspects is that the, the Psyche uh, mission, uh, I talked about it from the science perspective of going to study an asteroid. Um, where to go? There, I talked about it from the standpoint of of the science. One of the 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 technical demonstration uh, aspect of Psyche is that it's it is carrying a laser comm terminal, a laser communication terminal. So, during a, a once Psyche launches, as it's going to the asteroid, uh, there will be a test uh, part of the campaign or a test portion of the of its trajectory in which it will um, the the onboard laser communication terminal will beam a, um, a laser signal back to earth. And actually um, this antenna here, this is the antenna that's being constructed at Goldstone. The idea is that an inner part of that antenna will be removed and replaced with mirrors. Um, although the time scales don't quite work out, but the idea is to enable this in the future. Um, now in practice, this is probably not something for the near term for these kind of deep space missions. Uh, Earth orbiting missions, maybe missions to the moon, almost certainly you're going to see a lot more laser communication because it it can have higher data rates and lasers are not regulated the way razor, radio is. So you can actually use it without having to work. There's much less fear of interference. And so you can use it with with far fewer concerns about interfering with somebody else or somebody else interfering with you. So the advantage of that is that you'd be able to uh, um, pull out your cell phone and tweet about something uh, in, in proximity to the, uh, to the uh, uh, receiving antenna then, so. Yes, yes. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the receiving antenna, you, uh, well, in fact, um, the, it's not on here. Um, there was a um, a a uh, an earlier laser communication demo from a spacecraft orbiting the moon, and the ground terminal. I'm trying to remember, there were multiple. The the ground terminal was either twenty centimeters or forty centimeters. You know, so it's the ground terminal was something that you know if you're an amateur astronomer or if you're if you know amateur astronomers, you may know amateur astronomers who have larger telescopes than was used in this earlier demonstration. Uh, the key thing is, of course, you probably don't have a near-infrared detector that was such as what was used. But in terms of just raw glass uh, or you know a, a mirror, um, it, it's something an amateur astronomer could easily construct, or there, there may be amateur astronomers with, with telescopes today that could use be used in, in laser comm if they had the appropriate back-end detectors. So here was a question. Um, it was asked, uh, you know, very early on. Have any repeater antennas been used, either in Earth orbit or, or in solar orbit, or you know, how, all of these antennas are on the ground. We you haven't put anything in space yet, right? Well, actually, that's an excellent question. I didn't <laughs> touch on it. Um, most of the data, in fact, 
uh, you see here the the Insight mission and what was the one before Phoenix? Uh, was it Phoenix? Yeah. Um, most of the data from Curiosity, Insight, and Perseverance doesn't actually come directly through the deep space network. They are relayed through MRO or through Maven. Um, and I'm trying to remember if Mars TGO does any of this now, but but essentially in Mars orbit, there are at least a couple of these orbiters that serve as both their science of orbiters in their own right. So they take, you know, they do science uh, observations, but then they also collect data from one or more of the ground-based uh, assets, one of the rovers, and then relay it back to Earth. Uh, so it's it is being done at Mars again. At Mars, they're just there are enough spacecraft, and the uh, it's complicated enough and costly enough to put stuff on on the surface of Mars that it, it warrants doing relays. Uh, it's a big topic going forward in the uh, for the moon, but at the moment, Mars is the only place where this is really done in earnest. Okay. So, but there aren't any uh, necessarily around Earth, and so it's the relay that uh, you know because sometimes the, the rovers are on the opposite side and so they can continue to communicate with uh, something that's in orbit, so. Yeah, yep. Um, there, there seems to be, a, a questions keep coming up, uh, uh, some other additional questions come up about the directionality of uh, the antennas and getting the signals from various projects simultaneously or various missions simultaneously. And so I know that you had that graphic that showed that uh, you had uh, four missions that you were talking to. Um, and you had mentioned that I think that they're on different frequencies, but do they stagger those at all so that the, um, so that the equipment is, so how does that work? Um, it, well, so the, um, if you, um, so first off, the the antenna, if you think about um, what part of the sky the, the antennas can see, they can see enough of the sky that, it, let me take the specific case of Mars. Um, all of Mars and all of the spacecraft, all the orbiters around Mars uh, are in this, essentially in the same part of the sky as seen by the antenna. So the way it works is that connected to the antenna, uh, you can think of it as there, there are four different receivers. So the signal comes in and then it's copied four different times. And each one is set to a frequency specific to the spacecraft that's being received. Um, it's very much, you know, again, the analogy would be uh, if I if I go, you know, if I could, I you could take my car's antenna, car's um, um, uh, FM or radio antenna, and I could actually connect four different receivers to it and have four different radio stations being received simultaneously because they're all broadcasting simultaneously. And it's just a matter of picking out uh, using the appropriate frequency. Okay. Uh, actually, you know, because I talk about frequencies and sometimes radio frequencies, maybe another way to think about it is um, if if I had four different lights, um, you know, and say say they're turning on and off, they're, they're in fact they're coded. You know, suppose I'm using uh, lights to send Morse code, and one of them's blue, and one of them's green, and one of them's yellow, and one of them's red. Well, our eyes can see those four different colors simultaneously, those four different wavelengths, or those four different frequencies simultaneously. Now it might be a bit much for our brain to figure out, oh here's the Morse code from these four different things simultaneously. But but if I had, you know, a telescope that was looking at these four different lights, I could easily say, well, okay, you pick out the blue light, you figure out what the Morse code is from the blue light, you figure out what it is from the yellow, you figure out what it is from the red. And you could do that simultaneously. And that's what's happening. Okay. And I think that you uh, just answer this question too, but um, let, let's, you know, toss it out there. And so um, a couple of people have alluded to the tracking 
of these objects and whether or not the antennas have to be pointed directly at them and or you know do the antennas continue because these objects the the missions are moving they're not in a, in a single point and so do you end up having to track them and how close to you know perfect pointing do you have to be with the antennas for all these missions Okay, so the, 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 the simple answer is yes, uh, they are tracked. So a typical DSN track might be four to six to eight hours. And um, if, again, if you have any experience with um, just a typical telescope, um, you know what, Saturn is now a night sky object, right? So go point your telescope at Saturn. And if you don't continuously adjust, or, you know, if the motor on your, on your telescope doesn't continually adjust, Saturn will drift out of the field of view. Uh, so these antennas have to track. And, and for those uh, who know the distinction, that also means they have to track non-sidereally. They have to be able to track a planet as it moves instead of just the, the background stars. Um, now, in, uh, I should know these numbers because I've been bouncing them around. Um, the 70 meter antennas at our workhorse frequency, the blind pointing accuracy, so how well do you have to point it, is at the level of something like five or seven milli. The people, the engineers here use milli degrees. I'm more accustomed to arc minutes, but uh, the blind pointing, what? Um, six it's better it's sort of what uh if i'm doing the numbers correctly in my head it's something better than an arc minute uh, of blind pointing so you just point the antenna and then it has to be able to track at something like uh, better than an arc minute all the time uh to enable to maintain you know continually pointing toward these these spacecraft okay so one contrast and and we'll probably just go for a couple more questions but there's been a number of questions uh, about this um and so to contrast the strength of the signal that's coming in with the signal that you would then transmit in radar mode. And so what kind of, uh, um, you know, signal strength are you sending out? What kind of signal strength can you detect coming back in? And so if we can, you know, kind of relate those, those two. Um. Yeah, so uh, let's see. They're kind of um, they're kind of two answers to that. Um, the one simple answer is that um, so the the Goldstone Solar System radar itself, the the um, the radar system, the transmitter that is attached to um, the the seventy meter out at Goldstone DSS fourteen. Uh, that transmits at, in round numbers, 440 kilowatts. Uh, so you can easily, you know, go look at your electric bill. Uh, you know, if, if we run uh, the Goldstone transmitter for an hour, that's 440 kilowatt hours. And, you know, go look at how much, uh, I, in fact, I worked this out uh, once upon a time, you know, how many, how many houses would a, uh, a typical radar track power? And it's, it's many. Uh, you know, you probably, um, I'm, I'm now blanking on, yeah, I should, but, you know, go look at your electric bill and then sort of think about a kilowatt hour and think of the Goldstone transmitter is 450 kilowatt hour, you know, kilowatt hours after it works for an hour. Now, the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, so the other part of the question, though, is the signal goes out, you know, these asteroids are, they're still, they're distant. They're small bodies. They're not perfect reflectors. So the actual received power when the radar signal comes back is actually not that much different than the spacecraft signal. That's one of the reasons that we have to use these large antennas uh, is precisely because the, the signals, whether it's from distant spacecraft or from the radar reflections, they're, they're really faint. You know, they're measured in, in um, many, what, billionths of a, a watt or, or some uh, ungodly small number that, that these are really small power levels that are being detected. All right, so, um, so we are at the top of the hour and so let's uh, do one more question. And, and uh, so I just kind of want to ask what's, the, uh, what's your favorite part 
about this. And, and so if you have a favorite memory or, or something that you particularly, I guess, cherish about, uh, you know, working on the DSN and, and what's something in your mind that was really important that you were really delighted to have been involved with? Um, I think there are, I guess the two that stand, well, first off, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of, um, an antenna geek. So I've actually been out to all three complexes at least once. And I, I just get a thrill out of being, I mean, going into the antennas, you know, I've crawled up, uh, I've crawled up the 70 meter at Canberra and that's, you know, it's, I just like, that's cool. Uh, and then we actually had some issues with the, the, um, the Goldstone solar system radar uh, over the past few years that have now been uh, solved, but we had a period when it was off the air and bringing it back on air and just, you know, finally it's back at full power, it's operational and getting those first images. Um, you know, it's like what I didn't touch on is now there used to be the Arecibo observatory radar. That's, that's now gone, dearly departed. Uh, so the Goldstone solar system radar is really the only thing the planet earth has at the moment. And, you know, it's just been a real relief to see it continue to operate. Okay. Well, great. We'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing if you if you would. So that's all for tonight, everyone. Thank you very much, Joseph, for joining us this evening. And thank you for tuning in. I'm very sorry that we didn't get to uh, many of the questions that were in there, but uh, we got to a lot of them. So we had a really engaged audience this evening. So you can find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. This um, presentation is also on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel. And if you're more interested in some of those um, expeditions or missions to some of the asteroids, you can check out some other webinars that have to do with those. Um, join us for our next webinar on Tuesday, October 18th, when Jackie Faraday from the American Museum of Natural History will share with us how JWST will bring new discoveries and insights into low mass stars. Um, so we're kind of going from, you know, human constructed things. Now we're going to go back to thinking about some other things that are out there. Uh, so keep looking up and we will see you next month. And good night, everyone. Thank you so much. It was fabulous. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and actually, I I saw one question. I mean, if if.